This is 82nd Avenue, running north and south through the east side of Portland. Still a sketchy stretch of road. You probably don't want to walk down alone at night. It was even more dangerous back in the 1980s. A previously untapped market for drugs, by the mid-80s, Portland had become infiltrated by drug dealers, leading to a massive increase of addicts in the city. Now, I know the effects that can be had upon an individual, their family, in relation to this explosion of drugs that came into Portland in the mid-1980s and had massive effects on the city for years to come. I had family that lived near 26th and Alberta, which was kind of getting off towards like the eastern edge of where the major drug problem was. And that's where my cousin lived with his parents and he was shot to death in the head as a five-year-old by the guy that lived right across the way from them. And that guy was a young drug dealer. So I know the effects. And as I was, I remember probably like a year and a half, two years ago, reading up about this, this time period, the end of the 80s, when drugs just exploded in the city. And I read an account from somebody who lived in North, Northeast Portland, right in the middle of this. And they said, you know, if they would go out and sit on their front porch in front of their house, crackheads and tweakers just walking up and down the street was about as frequent of an occurrence as someone walking their dog or someone taking out their kids in a stroller. It was that crazy. It was just the norm to see addicts just wandering around. Literally right through here and especially like through this area down here, there were, I think within a few blocks, there was like eight to 10 crack houses. Like just, this was the hub. And I mean, you look at it now and it's like, it's all revitalized. You know, it's just, it's, it's a matching of, you know, it's a matching of times, you know. I was an infant when the peak of that was going on. 31 years old now. And it's the same, you know, it's the same area, it's the same place, it's all the same. And it just, it shakes you to your core when you really try to take it in and think about it and feel it. It really just shakes you up. You know, Roselawn, I'm walking through Crack Alley, Portland, you know, the crack capital for the whole history of the city of Portland and I just walked right through it. The combination of gang and drug infiltration, along with a spike in various forms of property and violent crime into a part of the city that had already been primarily neglected by the city for decades, made for the closest thing the city of Portland has ever had to a ghetto. And Dayton Leroy Rogers was right there in the middle of it.
flashback to 1976, and barely into his 20s, Dayton Leroy Rogers was on his way to a 10-year stint in prison, five years for coercion, and five years after his parole was revoked. Despite sex crimes going back to 1972, after a few years he became the subject of a possible parole. Anyone with half a brain should have realized this man did not need to be released back into the public. Yam Hill County District Attorney John Collins expressed that he'd never dealt with a person more dangerous than Rogers. Lane County Deputy District Attorney Daryl Larson called him an extreme danger to the community and, quote, a murder case waiting to happen. If he only knew. And what may have possibly been most telling, a parole officer, Jan Anderson, spoke to Rogers in 1982. When he asked what he would have done differently if he had to do it all over again, Rogers said that there wouldn't be a witness next time. Regardless, in 1982, he was paroled, and at the start of 1983, he was released from prison. Back in public. His wife had waited for him, and the two ultimately settled just outside Canby, Oregon. He got his repair shop going. They had their first child. Was it possible that, despite all the red flags, he'd actually turned his life around? All was not as perfect as it seemed. Again a free man, Rogers resumed drinking frequently as he'd begun back in the 70s. He started to have really bad headaches that only few things could relieve. And as time drew on, he was, as he claimed, spending more and more long nights at his shop. In reality, he began perusing the streets of Portland, primarily Union and 82nd Avenues, picking up women working the streets. He was there so often that many women knew him just based on his truck. His visits picked up more and more over time, peaking in the summer of 1987 where he'd sometimes drive around nearly all night looking for someone. His wife, as well as co-workers, noticed he started looking wiped out all the time and his work productivity began to decline. And while... Rogers' fellow co-workers were noticing some oddities. I don't think it was ever, it was ever enough for them to really think at the time that he was, you know, maybe harboring some big secret. Uh, but one particular co-worker of his pointed out a number of oddities that didn't really start happening until 1987. He took note of the fact that Rogers would randomly show up with these paper bags full of something, you know, almost like kind of like paper grocery bags. And he would see Rogers transporting these bags, you know, from his truck to the shop or the shop to his truck, whatever. He, ne he never actually saw what was in these bags, but it, it, it was enough to catch his eye. And something else he noticed was Rogers would often bring like an extra set of clothes to work with him, which which is kind of interesting considering their line of work. There wouldn't really be a need for an extra set of clothes for him to be bringing to work with him. And Rogers started leaving work at random times, you know, saying, oh, I, I got to drive off to here and, you know, get something for the shop, you know, always had some some excuse for why he was leaving. And he, he, he would even say, you know, I'll be back in two hours. And then he, he would show up several hours later than that. He would just disappear for these several hour long stretches. And he never really seemed to have any kind of real explanation for why it took so long for him to do these, these little ventures that he claimed were so, you know, essential for the shop. And what was really significant was this 
same male coworker noticed that whenever they discussed the issue of violence against women, which I don't know how often that came up, but Rogers would kind of chuckle. And he recalled one time traveling in Rogers' truck with him, and when he opened Rogers' glove box, there was a knife in there. And he, he certainly thought that was interesting. So little, little things like that started happening. I think even a coworker found a piece of a shoe in the wood stove they had there. Little things like this that were that were definitely interesting. And they were things that connected to Rogers during that time, the middle portion of 1987, that this kind of stuff wasn't ha happening really before then. So it was catching people's attention. So maybe Rogers was just tired from juggling work and his secret life as Steve the Gambler. Or was there something more? Marine Ann Hodges was a 26-year-old prostitute working the streets of Portland. She'd been addicted to drugs since her middle teen years, with her drug of choice being heroin. She began working the streets after dropping out of Benson Polytechnic High School, often working along 82nd Avenue on Portland's east side. She was known to be very kind-hearted, always looking out for her fellow girls. She'd even warned a few about a sketchy guy named Steve, who liked to pick up girls, as she'd had multiple experiences with him. Despite her many struggles... By May of 1987, it seemed as if Maureen's life was beginning to take a turn. The intersection directly behind me, that's Holgate crossing 82nd Avenue. And somewhere along the line, during the spring of 1987, she met a guy and moved in with him. They moved in, uh, she moved into his hotel room that he was staying at in downtown Portland, a place that at the time was called the Fairmount Hotel on, it would be um, 11th and Harvey Milk Street. And building is still there. You can tell even today by going by there that you can see that whole general area. It's a lot of old kind of rundown hotels turned into apartments. And it was a big area where there was just most of the hotels of that area were just flop houses for ex-cons, transients, prostitutes, drug addicts to come and stay, sometimes for lengthy periods of time. So Maureen moved in with this guy there and she kept her she kept her private life private from him he didn't know that she was a prostitute and then he came home one day and saw her shooting up heroin in the bathroom and confronted her about it where'd you get the money to do all this and she finally admitted that she was a prostitute so the guy she was with was you know pissed off especially that she had kept that from him. And he almost left her, but he decided to stick by. He really genuinely cared about her, it seems. And he actually was kind of helping her get her life back together. He managed to get her to, uh, like she was lowering her, the, her heroin usage. And things looked like they were getting better. That brings us to July 8th. 1987. Maureen decided to go out and buy some new clothes for the, the man in her life. And when she brought them home and gave them to him, he, because he still clearly had some issues with what she was doing with her life, he got just enraged. And the, apparently the thing that made him most angry was that she had bought these clothes for him with her her dirty hooker money. That seemed to be his attitude. So they, they got into a fight and Maureen took off, caught a bus and went down to 82nd to start working. And it's so sad. 
because that's the day she disappeared. So you think the last time this guy saw Maureen, they had this horrible fight together. Well, I'm not 100% certain exactly what he was doing. I get the idea he went out looking for her. Maybe he felt bad. Maybe he wanted to patch things up because Maureen's boyfriend ended up on a bus going down 82nd, which it seems like a stretch to me that he would just be randomly coming out to 82nd, which was a known place for prostitutes to be hanging out. I find it interesting that he would just randomly be coming down 82nd when he lived way over in downtown, way off that way. So I think he was looking for her. And as his bus passed through the intersection of Holgate and 82nd, he saw Maureen standing there waiting, you know, to be picked up by her next John. Her boyfriend said he got off at the next stop, which is maybe a little ways down there. Probably a little ways down there. I think coming from downtown, he would have most likely been going south on the bus he was on. But whatever the case, he got off at, off at his next stop. Heck, this may have even been the stop he got off at right here to go talk to her. But by the time he got off and got to where she was, it couldn't have been more than, you know, two minutes. She was gone. Her next John had picked her up. And Maureen Hodges was never seen alive again after that. A few blocks north of where Maureen Hodges was last seen, along Powell Boulevard and 82nd Avenue, was the main intersection where another woman known as Dee Dee often worked. Her real name was Cynthia DeVore. The product of a broken home, she ended up in the foster care system. A student at Washington Monroe High School, which closed down in 1981, DeVore felt lost when she had to transfer to Portland's Cleveland High School. And that's where her troubles really began. Despite multiple trips to rehabilitation and the birth of a child that she doted on to her core, by 1987, at the age of 20, she was a severe drug addict, bouncing from sketchy motel to sketchy motel and crack house to crack house. So this here is Powell Boulevard behind me. I've been through this intersection numerous times. It's still a little bit sketchy these days, but not like it would have been back in the late 80s. And on July 11th, 1987, DeVore was working this intersection as she often did. And she too just disappeared. Due to her transient state as a prostitute and drug addict, it took forever before anyone truly realized she was gone. She had a court date, which she never showed for, leading to a warrant being issued for her arrest. They didn't realize at the time that she never showed in court because she disappeared. It's believed the last day that Cynthia DeVore was seen alive was July 11th, 1987. On that same day, another sex worker, who often worked the same corner as DeVore, 82nd and Powell, was busted on a prostitution charge. She was 16-year-old Riatha Giles. This here is John Marshall High School, built in 1960 and right across the fence from where I used to work. So this high school has been closed since 2011, if I'm correct, and it has been recently serving as a backup high school to other high schools in the area while they've had their schools renovated. And back in 1987, 16-year-old Retha Giles, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing any of these names, 
somewhere, uh, sometime during that year, she dropped out of school and she kind of started running with kind of a rough group of friends and started hanging out a lot along 82nd Avenue, which is only a few blocks that way. And through these, you know, new friends that she'd made, Retha discovered that, you know, you could go down to 82nd and take on a life of prostitution and make quick money, which for a 16 year old, you know, that's huge. What 16 year old is making good money that they can spend on what they want? And that seemed to be kind of a selling point for her. And so she started doing that with her life. And come July 29th, her mother, who by that point was apparently living in Estacada, she contacted authorities and told them that Retha had been missing for about a week, that she had nobody had heard from her, she hadn't contacted home. She was, she was just gone. So approximately on July 21st, 1987 would be the last day that Retha Giles would be seen alive. She was reportedly seen on or around that date by her boyfriend. She was in the vicinity of Southeast 82nd and Division Street, which that intersection is right here, right behind me. She was, uh, by the account of her boyfriend on her way to meet a friend, and for whatever reason, she was last seen in this vicinity, and then she disappeared after that. There's no evidence that Riatha got mixed up in things like drugs and alcohol. She just found a method in prostitution that allowed her to make quick money. After Riatha's disappearance, those close to her suggested a past felon named Milton Graves may have been responsible. An ex-boyfriend to her mother, he showed up at her place a week before Riatha's disappearance, attacking her mother and forcibly injecting crack into her body. Graves had apparently kept drugs and guns at the home as well, and as he was on parole, he threatened to kill the whole family if they ratted him out to police. The close proximity to all this insanity certainly was coincidental with Riatha's sudden disappearance. Two days after Riatha Giles was last seen, 23-year-old Lisa Marie Mock would also vanish from the city. Born in Berkeley, California, by the age of 16, Lisa became mixed up with a rough crowd and a heroin addiction to go with it. Taken to a transient life, ultimately led her up to Portland, where she married another heroin addict named William Mock in 1986. Despite this horrible and likely codependent existence as wedded drug addicts, Mock actually managed to kick her habit for a short period of time before slipping right back into the powers of addiction. Working the streets as a prostitute, she found herself staying at the notorious Continental Hotel, on East 8th and Burnside Street. Once a rustic charm, the Continental had decayed along with its surroundings, and by the 80s, it was a haven for various criminals and drug addicts. Prostitutes also frequently used the location when they had clients. It was also a hotel where people had a strange way of turning up dead. Only a month earlier, in June, 26-year-old Candace Straub had been tied up and brutalized by two men before they set her and the motel room on fire in one of the most graphic and disturbing crimes in Portland history. Another headlining murder case at the hotel was the murder of Patricia Kleinberg, who was stabbed to death during a robbery in January of 1981. 
and these weren't the only murders that occurred at this motel during the 80s. In Lisa Mock's case, around 2 a.m. on July 23rd, she left the Continental to go get some cigarettes. She seems to have vanished after that. The next day, July 24th, 26-year-old Nonde Cervantes, also known as Noni, was reportedly last seen in the vicinity of a battered downtown hotel that she was living at during the time, like many Portland transients, fighting to get by. Originally from Arizona, Cervantes, who also went by the name of Austin, relocated to Oregon sometime in the 1970s. She would be arrested for indecent exposure in 1979 in Canby after stripping nude outside. It may have been an act of free-spiritedness, or it may have been a cry for help. She herself told a counselor that she needed psychiatric help. She was known to have a drug problem, but there's no definitive evidence that she worked as a prostitute. But a lot of the signs were there. During this heat of the summer, another woman, seasoned as a prostitute on Portland streets, Christine Adams, would also go missing. The 35-year-old Adams had been a prostitute since around the age of 20 as a method to support her children. She started by working the downtown area near the old Greyhound bus depot along 8th Avenue, but by 1987, she was living in Northeast Portland and working primarily along Union Avenue, likely the stretch she was working before she suddenly disappeared. Six women in just a few weeks had vanished from the city of Portland, but as working prostitutes, there was no consideration that their disappearances may have been linked. With Noni Cervantes being perceivably the last one to disappear, around July 24th, it would only be two more weeks before tragedy befell another local prostitute. Only this one wasn't left in mystery. Jennifer Lisa Smith was stabbed to death in the early morning hours of August 7th, 1987. But that was practically an open and shut case by itself. It was over. Three and a half weeks after the murder of Jennifer Smith, a hunter named Everett Lee Banyard took to the back roads leading from the town of Malala to this particular area. He pulled off on an old gravel road known as MF-75, going deep into the forest, looking for game to hunt. Upon his arrival, he detected a foul odor and noticed certain spots where the plant life had not just been flattened by something, but had been flattened out some time earlier. Banyard didn't pay too much attention to this, until he pulled back some ferns and discovered the decomposing body of a young woman. No, this was far from over.
Completely shocked, Banyard fled the scene and contacted the police who reported with him back to the site where he found the body. It had multiple stab wounds to the back and one of the feet sawed off. This body would later be identified as belonging to Riatha Giles. This was only the beginning though. As the crime scene was assessed into the following day, investigators were aghast to discover four more bodies relatively close together. The first new body was found around 10.30 a.m. It also had deep stab wounds to the lower back. Both of her feet had been cut off and there were saw marks on her right thigh bone. The body also had a tattoo with the word bitch on it. With help from this tattoo, this body would be identified as Lisa Marie Mock. At 12.30 p.m., the third body was found, propped up against a tree, whose abdomen had been completely sliced open all the way down to the groin. Her nipples also appeared to have been cut off. Later, this body would be identified as Noni Cervantes. Hours later, around 5 p.m., the fourth body was found. Her remains were almost entirely skeletal, and yet stab marks to the back were still noticeable. This body was found to be Cynthia DeVore. At 6.30 p.m., the fifth body was found, with the now expected stab wounds to the back. Her hands were bound and her right foot had been cut off. This body would be identified as Christine Adams. The following day, as the search resumed, two more final bodies were found, and whether there were more out there, somewhere in the forest, looms in mystery to this day. The first body of the day that was found, body number six, was entirely skeletal like Cynthia DeVore's remains, and the seventh and final body to be found had been scattered around by animals. She also had stab wounds to her back, and her legs below the knees were never recovered. The remains of this victim would be identified as Marine Ann Hodges. The remains of the sixth body would linger as unsolved, even though she clearly must have been connected to the other victims. A massive body dump site in rural Clackamas County, consisting primarily of women living in Portland. And yet, here they were, discarded some 40 miles away from there. What was this? How did this happen? There were whispers of fear that the notorious, and still unknown at the time, Green River Killer had moved south from Washington and was now killing primarily in Oregon. But there were many differences in how these women were killed as opposed to the Green River victims. There were few additional pieces of evidence beyond the bodies themselves that were found. Namely, a knife was found in the area, as well as a bunch of mini bottles of alcohol and orange juice. Not much to go on at first. However, over time, Investigators would learn of a man who frequently picked up prostitutes in the Portland area. He also often had a knife on his person and he was known to throw together screwdrivers with small bottles of vodka and orange juice. And, interestingly enough, he had recently killed a Portland prostitute. He was Dayton Leroy Rogers. Needless to say, by the time trial preparations were being made in the case of Jennifer Smith's murder, Rogers was already a suspect in these other murders. <laughs>